By your Holy Spirit, O God, open our ears and our eyes, our hearts and our minds to the Holy Word so that it comes to rule within us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 3. We begin in verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the Lord, excuse me, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again, a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went down and went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning, and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. This morning comes from St. John, and this is chapter 1, beginning in verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. 
Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't know if you picked up on it, but there were numerous uses of the term call or called or calling in our scripture readings this morning. It occurs over half a dozen times. And it leads me to think about questions like, what does it mean to be called? Is it something that only certain people experience? Is it something everyone experiences, but in differing ways? How can we tell if we've been called? Is a call like fate, or is it something that we can choose to turn away from? And these are questions you may or may not have ever thought about, but there are some that swirled around my head as I spent time with the text this week. When I think of the idea of being called, my mind immediately goes to the candidacy process that I went through when I became clergy in the United Methodist Church, because it involved all kinds of things. We had to do a credit check. We had to do psychiatric evaluations. We had to write papers. We had to go get a general physical done. <laughs> But time and time again, it involved interviews. And those interviews always entailed questions about how I had discerned a call to ministry. Now, the first couple times, I enjoyed recounting the story, especially when I'd never seen the people before. It was kind of like telling the story of something really amazing that had happened, like being part of a championship sports team or telling somebody about how you met a future spouse. But unfortunately... After telling it over and over and over again, not in the context of conversation or of giving witness, but just sitting awkwardly across the table from numerous men and women who were sitting there with pens and pads of paper, I actually started to resent giving the account of my calling on command. But now that I have close to a decade of space between those exhaustive trips to Glen Allen and the District Committee on Ordained Ministry meetings, I think I can better respond to those rhetorical questions that I pose this morning. I believe to be called means to have God invite you to surrender your priorities and desires to whatever degree is required for your will to be aligned with His. Now that's a somewhat complicated definition, but I think it's a necessary one. Because you see, God has created each one of us not simply to perform universal work for his kingdom, the generic making disciples, witnessing to his glory, etc., but also to live out roles that are especially unique and fashioned in accordance to our individual gifts and graces. We all have them, whether you realize it or not. <laughs> That's what Paul refers to when he writes about spiritual gifts and the importance of all those various members of the body of Christ, be they a tongue or an ear or a foot. So to be called is to realize who God has created you and equipped you to be. And so it follows, yes, a call is something that everyone has, though it may be discerned or experienced in a wide variety of ways. So how can you tell if you've been called? Well, I can offer a couple suggestions, though I'm sure this isn't an exhaustive list. For starters, I believe that when you're living into your calling, you experience the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. Now please note, that doesn't mean that you're without problems, struggles, challenges, or void of any negative emotions. It simply means that there's a peace offered to you by God that transcends those things that are realities for all of us that live in this broken world. Now, another way of knowing that you're living into your calling is that other believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, will be able to affirm witnessing the Spirit of God working in you. 
Maybe you've had the experience of knowing somebody who went through a significant change in their life. They go and get married, or they change careers, or they pick up and move to a new city, and then the first time you see them after that change, they just seem a little different, right? There's sort of a new peace or vibrancy or joy about them. They're hopeful, they're grateful. And then you go home and your spouse asks, you know, how are they doing? And you say, they're good. They seem like they're doing really good. That's what it's like to encounter someone who's living into their calling. But the role of other believers isn't just to recognize when you've come upon your calling. As is the case in my story, sometimes it's a brother or sister in Christ that points you in the direction of your call. Someone who says, have you ever thought about doing such and such? Fill in the blank. It could be a change of careers, becoming part of a specific ministry, or getting involved somewhere within the community. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, once said there is no holiness but social holiness. And what he meant by that, that term social holiness is often misinterpreted these days. What he meant by social holiness is that we cannot grow into the people God has created us and shaped us to be without relationship with others in Christ around us. There are no lone rangers in Christianity. Scripture says it's not good for man to be alone. And so if we want to discern and move in the direction of our calling and our spiritual growth and mature discipleship, it requires a give and take among brothers and sisters in Christ. Then the final question was whether a call was like fate or is it something we can choose to deny? Well, of course, we believe that humans have free will. Therefore, you always have the ability to turn your back on the call that God has placed on your life. But we should never forget that decisions have consequences. And just as Augustine wrote in the 5th century, our hearts are restless, God, until they find rest in you. In other words, when we elect to ignore God's call, we are choosing to ignore an invitation into shalom, peace, and wholeness of being. Can you be a kind, successful, and moderately content person without living into your call? Probably. But why would you ever desire to settle like that? As Paul wrote to the early believers in Corinth, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. The sacrifice made by God on your behalf, we talked about this during Sunday school, when Jesus hung on the cross, was anything but mediocre. Why then should the children he purchased with such a radical act be satisfied to live mediocre lives with mediocre fulfillment and mediocre holiness? I'm not suggesting our lives need to or should be glitzy or glamorous or extremely dramatic or over the top in other ways. But C.S. Lewis put it best when he described Christians, or at least human beings, as half-hearted creatures who fool around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. He said, we're too often like ignorant children who want to go on making mud pies in a slum because we can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. In other words, we're far too easily pleased. Just making it from day to day and being content with some basic comforts rather than answering the unique call God has placed on each of our lives is akin to settling for making mud pies while the car's packed and leaving for a vacation at the beach. We need a whole lot more Christians to step into their callings and contribute to the work of God's kingdom in whatever form that may take. For example, did you know that on one level we all share a common calling? I hope it's not anathema to quote this, but in our former Methodist Book of Discipline, there's a section, <laughs> there's some good stuff in there, there's a section, paragraph 126, titled, The Ministry of All Christians. And I quote it because it says, The heart of Christian ministry is Christ's ministry of outreaching love. Christian ministry is the expression of the mind and mission of Christ by a community of Christians 
that demonstrates a common life of gratitude, devotion, witness, service, celebration, and discipleship. All Christians are called through their baptism to this ministry of servanthood in the world to the glory of God and for human fulfillment. Now, while our reading from Samuel this morning is the archetypal text for calling, our reading from John is the quintessential evangelism and mission text. Because first, Jesus says to Philip, follow me. And amazingly, he did. (laughs) And it's truly remarkable. One of the reasons it's so shocking is because it's a little bit backwards from the way we're inclined to gather people into the Christian faith. There's this wonderful hymn by St. Richard of Chichester called Day by Day. And it contains the line, to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, and to follow thee more nearly. And it's a wonderful description of a way to lead a Christian life. It describes a growth in understanding and a growth in love and a growth in obedience. But it's not the way Jesus recruited his disciples. (laughs) Jesus didn't say, here are some commentaries on scripture and some books of theology. I want you to study them and get to know me. And then once you get to know me, I want you to describe, if you love me, what your love for me is like. And after that, you can follow me. What Jesus said was much simpler, but in a way more difficult. Jesus just said, follow me. And the reason this is so important is because it goes to the heart of what being a disciple means. A disciple is not one who studies the teacher. A disciple is a person who actually lives with the teacher. Jesus asked Philip to come and live with him. And one of the consequences of living with Jesus was that Philip became convinced that he was the one described by the language, him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. And so Philip in turn tells Nathanael, based on that perception, come, come and see. There are studies that show that most people, the vast majority of people, come to church and enter into salvation through Jesus because someone invited them. And that someone is rarely the pastor, by the way. Typically, this is a family member or a friend or a coworker, And it doesn't matter a whole lot what the motivation behind the invitation is. It can range from loving someone so much that you want to spend an eternity with them and knowing that a relationship with Christ is essential, to simply being kind enough to invite someone who doesn't have any friends and hope that that might be remedied by being part of a church congregation. But whatever brings a person in, the object of that is to spend time with Jesus to spend time with the teacher, to become a disciple. And then the disciples find themselves doing mission and ministry. And the doing of mission and ministry, they see and hear about lives being saved and changed in a Godward direction. They see and hear of signs and wonders. All Christians who are disciples who spend time with Jesus doing mission and ministry have stories of signs and wonders. And it all begins with the most important recommendation or invitation that we might ever make. The same one that Philip makes to Nathaniel. Come and see the Lord. There are countless people that you and I know or encounter on a daily basis who are looking for the love, joy, peace, hope, and forgiveness, salvation that the Christian gospel offers. People who are looking for some good news in the midst of all the bad news around us. We all have neighbors, friends, co-workers, and family members who are waiting the invitation to come and see. 
Just as Nathaniel had been eagerly awaiting Philip's summons, there are those around us, people in our lives, who are awaiting our invitation. And so the question becomes, who are the Nathaniels in our lives? Who might be waiting for such a recommendation from us? Because if we ourselves have discovered the good news of the gospel, if we have encountered the love and forgiveness and peace and fellowship and salvation as a member of God's faithful people, then we have an invitation to make. Surprisingly, it might not always be to come and see at this specific church we're gathered at today. I mean, depending on the context and the circumstances, some folks need to come and see in the Presbyterian church down the road from where they live or the Lutheran church, or the Baptist church, or even after Sunday school this morning, the Pentecostal church. (laughs) We simply might need to direct them from there, and that's all right. This might sound strange coming from a pastor in a Wesleyan tradition, but we're not all meant to be cut from identical theological fabric. But we are all meant to come and see to encounter God's saving grace. Like Philip, the responsibility for the recommendation rests with each of us. There's a story told about three young friends who received an invitation similar to Nathaniel's to come and see. And with mild interest, they pulled into a grassy parking lot one night and they entered a huge tent where a revival meeting had already begun. And the assembled crowd was midway through the opening hymn and the tent was packed. And it seemed like there was no room for the young men to sit. And just as they turned to leave, an usher spotted them. And he made his way over and he led the young men to three empty seats in the front. We don't know much of what became of that usher or what his name was. But we do know that one of those three young men committed his life to Christ that night, just as Nathaniel did in today's gospel. And that man's name was Billy Graham. Had that usher not recognized the opportunity and taken those three young men to a seat up front, they might not have heard the good news proclaimed. Who are the Nathaniels in our lives awaiting the invitation to come and see? Who are the Nathaniels among us today looking for a seat? hoping for a smile or a kind word, in search of unconditional love and forgiveness, seeking a spiritual friend and fellowship. Who are the Nathaniels among us today? Might we open our eyes and reach out to them? Might each of us be a Christian vessel of love and peace and forgiveness, just as that unnamed usher was so many years ago? Going back to the passage from our former discipline, Under the heading, the ministry of the laity, it continues. The ministry of the laity flows from a commitment to Christ outreaching love. Lay members of the church are by history and calling active advocates of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every lay person is called to carry out the Great Commission. Every lay person is called to be missional. The witness of the laity, their Christ-like examples of everyday living, not fantastical living, everyday living, as well as the sharing of their own faith experiences of the gospel, here it comes, is the primary evangelistic ministry through which all people will come to know Christ. The everyday life of Christians is the primary evangelistical ministry through which people will come to know Christ. Not huge events, not multi-million dollar programs, not ad campaigns, not door-to-door canvassing. The day-to-day life of Christian believers is the primary evangelistic means by which people will come to know Christ. That is the foundation of our calling. Whatever other forms it may take in place, vocation, direction, or pattern, it must be based on being an advocate of the gospel of Jesus Christ and a servanthood in the world to the glory of God. 
The people of God who are the church made visible in the world must convince the world of the reality of the gospel or leave it unconvinced. There can be no evasion or delegation of the responsibility. The church is either faithful as a witnessing and serving community or it loses its vitality and impact on an unbelieving world. There's no age limit, skills test, or any other prohibitive barrier in place. Any man, woman, or child who has entered by faith into the body of Jesus Christ is empowered by his spirit to accomplish all that he calls them to. You can neither be too old nor too young, too uneducated, too weak, too introverted, too rich, too poor for God to call you, but you can be too comfortable, too complacent, too secure, or too indifferent to hear or answer the call. The Army used to have an ad campaign that used the slogan, be all you can be in the Army. Y'all remember that one? It was all over the TV and, and, well, in the radio when I was in high school. We were not simply saved from something when we accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. We were saved unto something. And we can never be all that we can be until we step into that calling through the power of His Spirit. We need to pray to see it in ourselves, and in us, each other. Who are our Nathaniels? We need to seek them out as Philip did and invite them to come and see. We need to build one another up in encouragement to take risks and do things that are counterintuitive to the ways of the world in order to further God's kingdom. We need to let ourselves be molded by the power of God into the men and women he created us to be. Because indeed, we may have been awestruck by our first encounters with the saving grace of Christ, but he promises us, just as he promised Nathaniel, if we truly abandon our lives to him, we will see greater things than these. Very truly, we will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And that is definitely something we should all want to come and see. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.